Okay, hi everybody. I hope you're uh, enjoying the conference so far. Uh, okay. I think we're gonna Larson a little. Uh, so thanks for attending uh, this session on optimizing uh, for cost efficiency uh, for data flow. So we're gonna take you through our journey uh, at Orange. So my name is Jeremy Gomez. Uh, I'm a data consultant in the professional services uh, at Google. And so I help our customers migrate from their on-premises systems to a uh, Google Cloud platform, uh, mostly. And uh, I've worked for some time uh, with Orange, lastly. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Thomas, I'm a data engineer. I work at Orange, and we both come from, from Paris, France. OK, so uh, this is what we're going to present you. So first, we're going to tell you about our use case uh, for Orange, then the initial architecture that we had and the initial decisions. And then we'll take you uh, through our journey of optimizing the data flow pipeline. And finally, we'll show you the final results uh, that, we, that we had. Go. So now, the use case on which we worked. Uh, let's start with a little overview of Orange. Orange is the largest telecommunication operator in France and the fourth largest in Europe. It's, it's present in 26 countries, may, mainly in Europe and Africa. Uh, Orange has a revenue of just over 42 billion euros per year and about 142,000 employees. Now the use case. We call it Figaro AC. The scope for this use case is the free kind of Orange devices deployed in houses of the Orange Fonts residential customers. So there is the residential gateway, we call it Livebox, the set-top box or TV decoder, and the Wi-Fi extender or Wi-Fi repeater. Inside these three kind of devices, there is a software probe uh, deployed, and we call this probe Figaro. And these probes collect various type of logs, some very technical, like uh, CPU and memory usage, or power consumption, and some a little bit more functional, like one and homeland statistics or Wi-Fi statistics. So what does this use case? It performs four main operations. The first one is uh, the processing and ingestion pipeline of the Figaro data. And this is the purpose of this talk, so we will uh, talk about this uh, later in more detail. After it computes daily KPIs, we compute a little bit more than 300 uh, indicators per day. We enrich this uh, KPI with uh, some information about the customers or their devices. And finally, we deliver uh, some of the computed data to other application of the Orange information system. And there is three main purposes for this use case. The first one is to execute proactive action like a reboot or pushing some configuration. The goal here is to try to uh, correct something before the customer notice there is something wrong. A simple example is when the CPU load average is over 80% for the previous day, Figure OSC will send a reboot command to the device. Second purpose is to provide diagnostic labels for the customer services to help them resolve customer problem. Um, some examples of these labels are Emma's iPhone is nearly out of range, or there is a 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi frequency saturation in the neighborhood, or the Wi-Fi extender is too close to the residential gateway. And the last purpose is to provide some of, some of the computed data to our application, and for example, the Orange and Me mobile application, to help customers resolve their problem on their own. So after this quick presentation, um, let's see what is our main issue. The main issue is mainly related to the very large volume of this uh, data. There is about uh, 15 million Orange Front devices with an active Figaro probe. Connected to these devices, there is about 17 million end-user Wi-Fi devices. Here, when I speak about end-user Wi-Fi devices, it's the device of the customers uh, like uh, mobile phone, tablet, computer, or any other smart, smart Wi-Fi devices connected to the Orange devices. Um, all of that generates a little bit more than 140 billion logs per day. So it's huge. And it represents about 33 terabytes of uh, data into BigQuery. And as we keep the data a little bit more than one month, 
it's uh, a little bit more than one petabyte of uh, BigQuery active storage. So now let's focus on the ingestion pipeline and see what its architecture is and what the initial decision we made about this pipeline. Firstly, why we choose Dataflow? We choose it because it's a fully managed service. So as a GCP customer, it's easier for us. And also there is a promise of auto scaling. There were also all the native input and output connectors for every GCP product we were thinking of using, and especially BigQuery. I didn't say it explicitly, but the goal of this ingestion pipeline is to put the figure out data into BigQuery. And because of the BIM framework also, uh, because in my team at Orange, we have some Java skills. We also know well Spark. And this, the, the learning curve was not so big for us to start uh, working with uh, with BIM, not to master BIM, but to, to start working with BIM. And also the BIM code can run on other runners, so we are not fully locked with data flow. So here is uh, the main transformation done by this pipeline. It's quite easy. We just have to combine two rows, one with a header and the second one with uh, um, something in, in a binary format and compressed format representing about one, one hour of logs coming from one device. So we, had, we have to parse this data and compress it, split data into logs and extract the useful information. And we also have a little work to do about the timestamps are as depending on the firmware version, um, the timestamps arrive in with an UTC time zone or uh, the local time zone where the device is located. So we have to do some adjustments and especially for device located in the French overseas territory. So now the architecture, it's quite simple and, and conventional. The, the figure raw data arrive in a GCS bucket, so an object storage. On this GCS bucket, there is a notification activated. So every time a new file arrives, a new message is published in a pod subtopic. Our data flow pipeline here with the gray background subscribe to this pod subtopic. So it reads every notification, then read the files corresponding to this notification, process the data, and write it to BigQuery. See, it's quite simple. Our, our issues are not related to the architecture or to the transfer which is quite simple, but it's mainly related to the large volume of data to ingest into BigQuery. So what were our initial decisions? As files arrive about every minute, and even a little bit more frequent, uh, we choose to use a streaming pipeline. And the default BigQuery IO for streaming jobs uh, was the legacy streaming API. Of course, not called legacy at that time. Here is a little code sample on how you can write to BigQuery with the streaming API uh, and the BigQuery. It's quite simple. Um, but for the first try, the performance was really unsatisfactory. And thus, we had to do some first improvements. The first one was to activate the auto sharding feature, which require also to activate the streaming engine. We will talk a little bit later about the streaming engine. Um, here is how you can activate the auto sharding, also quite simple. The performance were, of course, improved, but it was really not enough. When looking at the jobs log, we saw that we hit a 100 megabytes per second limit. And we also saw that we could increase this limit to one gigabytes per second by deactivating the insert IDs. Here is how you can do it. Insert IDs is a mechanism to avoid duplicate uh, when writing with the streaming uh, API to BigQuery. But at that time, it was not our first concern as we just want to start ingesting our data with a sufficient performance. So with all of that, the performance were acceptable, but without any leeway. We, we were really close to the one gigabytes limits and sometimes uh, cross this limit. But still a great news, uh, at least we can make a first significant run with a first cost projection. And here comes our problem, $5.8 million per year. <laughs> Much more than expected for this ingestion pipeline. And this is the beginning of our journey to cost optimization. Thank you. 
Okay, so, and this is pretty much when uh, the professional services uh, uh, come and try to work uh, with Orange on this because the cost was, uh, was too, too big. So let us take you through our journey here. So we'll show it to you in five steps. So the first one was, uh, is about the BigQuery storage write API. And, but you can also, you know, uh, get some information, uh, more global information about the way you treat your dependencies and you know them. The second one is tuning the data flow configuration. Third one, optimizing your actual beam code. The fourth one is about helping the autoscaler when it doesn't do exactly what you want. And the, the last one, kind of a spoiler, reconsidering batch. So a little disclaimer. Uh, so what we did is we recently rerun the tests to make sure we understood the gains for each uh, step. But for this presentation, we grouped some of the steps together for clarity. So don't quote us on the intermediate gains, but the gains at the beginning and at the end are accurate. And you know, every time uh, that uh, we apply an optimization and it, it did something different during the project and during the reruns, we will let you know. Because as you, as you will see, uh, the gains that you will have uh, depend on the order on which you're going to apply your optimizations and, of course, uh, on your pipeline. Okay, so let's go. Let's start with the first one, which is working with our dependency. And our dependency here is, the, is BigQuery. So uh, let's have a little look on how you can ingest into BigQuery. So you have three main APIs. The first one is called the Load API. It's for batch loading into BigQuery. It's free uh, unless you want guaranteed capacity. And in, in Google Cloud Platform, you can buy slots and then create what we call a pipeline reservations. But otherwise, it's free. Uh, then the legacy stream API. So now it's very clear it's called legacy. But at the time, it wasn't called legacy. And so this one is for loading streaming um, streaming into, into BigQuery. And you pay uh, by uh, the ingested volume of the data. And then finally, the storage write API, which is now uh, like a way to unify uh, loading into batch or streaming, micro batch, anything in between. And you pay also per the volume ingested, but you, you pay pretty much half of what you're going to pay with the legacy streaming API. Uh, there are some new capabilities that we're going to talk about. And you know now it's recommended for any streaming pipeline into, uh, into BigQuery and also for high performance uh, batch loading. So step one, what did we do? Okay, let's use the BigQuery uh, storage API. Why, what rationale? Well, because the API is twice uh, as cheap and because we don't have the one gigabyte per second limit uh, and it's performance and it also has like new capabilities like uh, exactly one's uh, ingestion. We had some obstacle there because the first thing you need to know if you're using BigQuery too in your, in your pipeline is that uh, if you're writing to regional tables, you have the 300 megabyte per second limit. So go with multi-original uh, tables and you're going to have like a three gigabyte per second limit, which was enough uh, for us. Uh, also, no auto sharding. So you pretty much have to uh, understand yourself how many streams you're going to open uh, in BigQuery. And the documentation was a little bit limited. And for instance, uh, here, uh, you see how you can uh, activate the, the storage write API, and you see that you have to uh, define a number of streams, and you have to do it yourself. So you kind of have to experiment a little bit, and in the end, the actual number of streams that are going to be open is not the one that you put in your code here. It's not going to be 90. It's going to be 90 times the number of tables that you're writing to in Bitcoin. So, you know, that might be a little bit runner dependent, but at least in data flow, that's what we observed. So we hit lots of quotas, uh, undocumented ones, and but in the end, it was all right. And that was a, a big gain here. Uh, we reduced the number of workers uh, and we also reduced. So I told you that when you use the storage write API, you cut your cost by half ingestion costs. But in fact, we cut the cost by 85% because for some reason, Using the legacy uh, streaming API, we saw more data going through the API than we actually had. So we didn't, didn't really investigate. But if you're writing to BigQuery, uh, you might see very big uh, improvements using the, this, a, this API. And we also tried one more thing. As I told you, uh, the BQ load API, which is a batch API, is free. So why not use it? 
it is very possible to use a streaming data flow job, but using the BQ load API. So like every, if you look at the code, uh, you're gonna you're gonna say in the trigger, for, for instance, every two minutes, you're gonna do the BQ load. And um, we just wanted to try it because it's free. Uh, in our case, it wasn't enough. Like the latency of our streaming pipeline kept increasing. So we just roll back, uh, roll, roll back down. So keep in mind, if you're using a BigQuery with, with data flow, use the BigQuery storage write API um, for high throughputs and use a multi-regional destination table. Uh, as long as auto sharding is not available, you're gonna have to experiment on the number of streams. And you know, more generally here, we talked about BigQuery, but it's important that when you optimize a data flow pipeline or a beam pipeline more generally, try and understand how your external services are working. Like if you're using a memory store, for example, like Redis, uh, of course, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be able to do very, very fast memory access. If you're using another kind of database, maybe you don't want to use it that way. So make sure you understand how Beam and your external dependencies are working together. Okay, now second step of the journey, tuning the data flow configuration. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> So after switching to the BigQuery storage rate API, we try to tune some data flow configuration. Here is some thing you can tune. The first kind of thing uh, of configuration you can try to set is the machines configuration. So you can choose the worker family and one and two or any other worker family available in the GCP compute engine. And you can ch change it without additional costs. As data flow is pressed, according to the number of vCPU and not the type of vCPU. Um, you can also set the worker size, so the number of vCPU per, per worker, uh, two, uh, eight, 16. And you can also uh, set the number of threads. Uh, so here is the default values for Java pipelines, 300 threads per vCPU for a streaming job and one thread per vCPU for a batch job. Apart from this machines configuration, you can also activate or deactivate some data flow feature. The first one is the streaming engine, which moves state and shuffle to a backend service. Of course, there is a charge associated with this feature, but in exchange, it will reduce the number of workers required to process your data. So less disk, less memory, less CPU. And it also provides a, a more reactive and a smoother auto scaling. The data flow shuffle, which is quite similar, but for batch jobs and something different, the data flow pram, which is still in pre-GA. It's a fully serverless uh, data processing platform for Apache Beam pipelines, and it provides more optimized resource management and some cool feature like uh, uh, vertical auto scaling, but I think it's still for uh, Python streaming pipeline for, for now. So now let's dive into the four parameters we tried for our use case. The first thing we tried was to change the worker family from N1 to N2. The rationale was um, N2 workers have a more recent CPU architecture. And as it's priced the same, why not try to use a better CPU? And there was no obstacles uh, and it will be the same for uh, over configuration as is just some parameters to set when starting your pipeline. Here is the parameters. For the impact, um, we unfortunately do not observe the same result between the project phase and the rerun. And for the project phase, we observe a less ag aggressive upscaling and then the number of the average number of workers required to process all data was uh, decreased. But during the rerun, um, it was quite the same with N1 workers and N2 workers. But as it's priced the same, uh, we will keep continue using uh, N2 workers for the next tests. The second parameters we tried uh, was to change the worker size. We start with big workers with 16 vCPU, and then we try with smaller workers with 8 vCPU and even with 4 vCPU. Um, when looking at the job metrics, we saw that CPU and memory might be a little bit underutilized, so it suggests that uh, CPU was not the limiting factor, and then that maybe with, uh, with smaller worker, we could 
better use the CPU and reduce the total number of CPU required to process all data. Uh, here is how you can set the, the worker size. It's the same parameters uh, where you set the worker family and the worker size. Um, for the impact, it was slight, but we could reduce the number of workers uh, required to process of data. So we estimate uh, about uh, a decrease in our cost by, by about 5%. And the third parameters we tried was to change the number of threads. So we tried with value greater and lower than the default value, which is 300. And we thought that maybe with a tuned level of parallelization, we could um, better use the CPU and reduce the number of CPU required to process our data. Here is how you can set the number of threads. But we did not observe any significant impact. Thus, we will keep continue using the default uh, number of threads. But that doesn't mean it's useless to play with these parameters as maybe it can have some effect on our pipelines. And I think here, especially about the, the batch jobs as maybe the default value one is maybe a little bit low. And the, first, the last thing we tried was to deactivate the streaming engine. Uh, the rationale was um, the streaming engine is priced according to the volume of shuffled data, which is quite big in our use case. So um, maybe um, even if the number of workers required to process our data has to be increased uh, without the streaming engine, maybe the total cost could be decreased. So here is how you can uh, activate or deactivate the streaming engine when starting your pipeline. And for the impacts, um, as for the worker family, we did not observe the same results between the project phase and during the rerun. During the project phase, the costs were decreased by about uh, 10%. But during the rerun, the costs were quite uh, similar between uh, with and without the streaming engine. So what, could, what to keep in mind here? Your mileage may vary depending on your beam pipeline and your data, of course. Um, you can observe that some parameters have significant effect and overall have no significant effect. Um, it's quite easy to try to set these parameters. Yeah, just something you have to, to set when starting your pipeline, but it will require time and many experiments to try to find the best for your use case. So for us, uh, we could reduce the cost by about 5% with this tune level of configuration. Now Jeremy will speak about batch for consideration. No, beam, beam optimization. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. So, uh, you know, you can only go so far by tuning the, 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 the configuration. At some point, you're going to have to look at your beam code and make sure that you're not doing anything bad. Like there are some best practices that you should follow when, you, when you're uh, coding in beam. So what we did here is like we tried to condense in one slide a few of the best practices that maybe you've seen in other places uh, that you, sh you should make sure that you're following them or if they're bad that you're not following them. So the first thing would be following the best practices and the second thing would be actually to profile your code to see where you're spending the most time. So let's start with uh, the best practices. So as with many distributed systems, the shuffle operation is usually the most ex expensive. So when you do, you know, group by key, co-group by key, anything that will create shuffle, make sure you filter first. If you can filter before your shuffle operations, uh, do it because it's, go it's going to make a difference. Uh, also, uh, be careful not to instantiate your costly op operation in the process element method, uh, like opening database connections, for instance. Make sure that you're using the setup method so do this, the thing in green and not uh, the thing in red, because if you, if you create your connection for every element you process, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, so like in green, you can, you can assign, uh, for example, this is pattern compilation for regular expression. So you can assign that to a, a static variable in your, in your class. Just make sure that uh, your object is thread safe because you're going to access it in your process element from multiple threads. Uh, Another thing is try to use efficient coders. 
So as you know, uh, in Beam, you're going to serialize a lot of data for shuffling between the workers. And it's quite famous that in Java, for instance, the, cost, the, the default serializer is quite bad. So make sure you're using uh, a better one, like the Avro coder. You could also use the Snappy uh, coder. I've used uh, lots of good things recently about Snappy. Like it reduces a lot the size of your uh, serialized data. So make sure you do that. Uh, also, we had a talk about this yesterday, but uh, if you have like operations like co-group by key that uh, have big shuffle, uh, try instead to use a side input. Like if you're, instead of doing your join with the group by key, because so if your side input is small enough, you're gonna be able to not do that much shuffle. So it's gonna, it's gonna be uh, more efficient. Be aware of state fusion, small key space, data skew. So this one, we also had the, you know, talks about this. So uh, maybe you know that Dataflow does state fusion. So if you have multiple steps with no shuffle, all the steps are going to be fused and they're like one step and the next step are going to be done in memory. But sometimes you don't want state fusion. And one case where you don't want state fusion is for high fan out uh, transforms. So for instance, on this one, uh, uh, imagine that you have a P collection with 10 keys processed on one worker. And let's say each key has 10 elements, but then you have this pardo here, this P transform that generates a thousand elements as an output for each one element in an input, uh, where you're gonna end up with uh, 10 keys that have each 10,000 elements. And maybe at this point, you don't want it to run on the same worker. You want to reshuffle stuff so that your data is used on more workers. So, you know, in this case, uh, use the reshuffle transform. So you make sure that your data uh, is actually, you're breaking stage fusion and you are, you're shuffling your data. Another, another thing is skewed data. So imagine that you have you know, data about customers, and they live in America, Europe, and Africa, you have three keys. So first, uh, it's not great if you have three keys because your parallelism is going to be three. The key space is not, it's not very huge. So let's try and have, you know, try have more keys than just three. Let's imagine that they ended up, each key ends up being uh, computed in one different worker. And you see the one on the top there, it has many more elements than the others. So this is what we call skewed data. And here you see worker one is going to have to do much more work than the other workers. And so this is not great parallelism, it's not going to be great there. So see if you can make another kind of key instead of having America, Europe, and Africa, try to have America dash, blah, 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 a number or something. Try to redesign your key because otherwise uh, you're gonna have a bad performance in terms of parallelism. Uh, another thing, if possible, uh, try and make sure that your source is splittable. Like if you have a gzip, uh, uh, I believe this one is not splittable, so it's gonna be uh, uncompressed in only in one, one worker, not great. Uh, be careful with excessive logging. This one, sometimes you don't realize, but if you log too much, you're gonna have a very slow pipeline. And Java is usually more performant than Python as a, as a, as a rule of thumb, let's say. So if you have a very CPU intensive job, uh, maybe you wanna try uh, other, you wanna try the JVM maybe. Okay, so just a few best practices uh, in one slide. And then the second thing is, okay, you have your beam code. So for instance, uh, for us in Orange, we didn't see any bad practice in the code, but we said, let's try and optimize. Let's see uh, if we can profile the code. So if you're using Dataflow with GCP, you can just do uh, this flag uh, there, and it will enable you to use the cloud, pro cloud profiler. And in our case, what we did is we profiled the code, and we realized that we had some CPU intensive parts on regular expression compiling. Uh, so we thought, you know, if we decrease uh, like these parts, if we optimize these parts, we might need fewer CPUs. And uh, so that's what we did. We optimized them and we saw an impact on CPU time uh, on the profiler. And during the project, we didn't see a significant increase, uh, decrease, but during the reruns, we saw a 16% uh, cost decrease we had fewer um, workers uh, by doing this, uh, this optimization. So keep in mind that the way you're going to code your pipeline is probably the most important thing in terms of performance. 
So try to follow a few best practices. We, we have lots of best practices during the BIM Summit here. Uh, and in complement to that, try to profile your code and see if you can uh, improve your code. And also you can use, if you're using Dataflow again, uh, you can use the UI from Dataflow, look at the metrics, and they might also be uh, useful to understand which parts of the code you should, you should optimize. So 16%, not too bad. Uh, and the next phase was try and help the other scale. Okay, now let's have a look about the data flow to scale. Um, it has its own algorithm, and here are the rules for streaming uh, pipeline. So it will scale up when the average CPU utilization is over 20% and the backlog is over 15 seconds for a couple of minutes and scales down if the reverse CPU utilization is under 75% and the backlog is under 10 seconds for a couple of minutes. At least for the moment, you cannot adjust these thresholds, but you can try to tune some parameters to try to guide this autoscaler. So the first thing you can try is to Activate the streaming engine, which um, usually provide a more reactive and a smoother auto scaling. You can also set the initial number of workers, the maximum number of workers, and there is a new but still experimental parameters to set the minimum number of workers. It can be sometimes useful to avoid to don't scale to a too low number of workers as your latency will increase quickly. And then the autoscaler will have to scale up to a very high number of workers to catch your latency up. And this is a little bit suboptimal and sometimes really costly operation. So what we did for our use case, we made many experiments to try to find the best uh, initial and maximum number of workers. Uh, the rationale was, um, we observed that the, um, the autoscaler algorithm was not really cost efficient for our use case. It scales um, too much and stay hard for a long time. So, and our use case can tolerate a little bit of latency. It's not um, a real issue for us. So uh, there were a big waste of resources. Uh, also, it cost, uh, it, it, it was a high cost. So no obstacles to, to set these parameters, it's just uh, something you set when starting your pipeline, here are the parameters. And for the impact, um, our data are slightly constant. We have almost no variation within a day or between two consecutive days. Um, so we converge to use an initial number of workers equals to the maximum number of workers, which was 70 workers with 8 vCPU each in our use case. and um, this was a little slightly higher than uh, our needs to process our data. And then the autoscaler will never scale down with, with that configuration. So we almost deactivate the, the autoscaler algorithm, but that was the best compromise for, for us. So what to keep in mind, of course, the autoscaler is a really useful feature. Um, but at least for the moment, it's not very customizable, so you will have to deal with the rules of this autoscaler. Uh, but you can try to um, set some parameters to guide this autoscaler, and it can be a huge source of cost reduction. For us, we estimate uh, this, uh, this cost reduction was about 37%. And no batch for consideration. All right, the last step uh, of our journey. It might be a, a step in your journey too, because you know, as engineers, I guess most of us are here. We always love streaming. You know, it's so exciting. We are, we're doing uh, complicated stuff. Uh, we're doing uh, near real time things, and you know, in fact, sometimes you just have to accept. Maybe you're going to cry a little bit, but uh, you don't really need streaming. Well, in our case, uh, we didn't really need streaming. So. Uh, Stream versus batch in a uh, in beam. Uh, well, you know it's very easy uh, first to switch between a uh, batch and streaming. Uh, just change your your I/O, and also the streaming workers are fifteen percent more expensive. And uh, if you are in batch, you re remember that we are writing to BigQuery. So if you are in batch, you can use the BQ load API, which is free. So it's also a cost that we gain. Uh, and you know, in our case, at the beginning, we chose streaming for technical reasons. We, you know, we thought 
one file every minute. It's going to be a huge throughput, one gigabyte per second. Uh, batch is never going to cut it. So we chose streaming. But in the end, I just at the, in the back of our heads, we're like, mm, maybe we should still see if batch uh, is OK. But we didn't have any business reasons for choosing, uh, for choosing streaming. Like, it's OK if we have 30 minutes, one hour of latency. So this is what we did. We changed the I.O. Uh, from PubSub back to uh, Google Cloud uh, Storage. And actually, the rationale is that if performance is sufficient, wow, we don't have to pay for the BigQuery API uh, for loading. And the, uh, and the workers are cheaper. So OK, we did that. And in fact, so we, we run our job every 30 minutes. And it actually takes 18 minutes uh, to, uh, to finish with, with the 30 workers. So that removed the ingestion cost. The batch workers are less uh, expensive. And that decreased cost a lot. So it's a little bit of cheating because you know we're not using streaming anymore. But still, it was a, a big uh, cost reduction. So keep in mind, it's nice to use streaming. But if your business case does not require it, just start with that. Try uh, a batch pipeline first. Final results. Okay. Summary of our journey. Um, for us, the two main drivers for cost reduction was um, the switch uh, to the BigQuery storage rate API and the batch for consideration. For the BigQuery storage rate API, as it's far less expensive and much more efficient, just forget about the streaming API and use this storage rate API to ingest in streaming your data into BigQuery. For batch reconsideration, of course, it will have a strong um, impact on latency and therefore strongly change your use case. So maybe it might not be possible for you. But uh, if latency is not an issue, uh, you should reconsider uh, to use a batch job. Of course, another issue to address is the um, beam optimization, the code optimization. So make sure you follow the beam coding best practices and use tools like Google Cloud Profiler to help identify bottlenecks. Last but not least, you will have to tune your data for configuration. It's quite easy to do, but it will require time and many experiments to try to find the best uh, parameters for your use case. And you can also focus on the parameters to try to guide the autoscaler, as at least for us, it was a huge source of cost reduction. And here, um, and now what you are all waiting for, the final results. So by keeping a streaming pipeline with a low latency, we could uh, divide the cost by five to $1.2 million per year. So it was a great success. And of course, <laughs> uh, the cost manager were really happy with this news. And even better by switching to a batch pipeline with um, about 30 minute latency for us. Um, the costs were decreased by 13 from the starting point, so to $440,000 per year. And now with this batch pipeline, it's uh, the data flow uh, represents about 35% of the total cost, and the BigQuery storage has become the main source of cost. Thank you. So just uh, a final thought. There are a few things that we didn't try and that you might want to try. We didn't try FlexRS. I guess this is something, it's, it's data flow. So it's only data flow, but it's something if you have a batch pipeline and you're OK to have some delay at startup and you're OK to use preemptible machines, then you can use that and you're going to cut your costs. And we didn't use Dataflow Prime. So you know this new serverless uh, service, which has a different pricing model and you know, we didn't try it all together, but it might have been a good thing. So one thing you have to remember from this talk is that your mileage will vary. Uh, you know, for us, this is what worked, but on other pipelines, you know, for, for example, the configuration of data flow for us, 5%, not, not great. But for another uh, pipeline that I worked on for, for another customer, this was really, really impressive. So, you know, don't think that our numbers are the numbers that you're going to get. Just try and maybe take some ideas from the presentation, but your pipeline will be different. 
so the main message here is to experiment. Uh, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, also, we have we had the the talk by uh, Roy yesterday about the benchmarking. So it's a, it's a way to experiment with uh, with big volumes. And uh, yeah, that's about it. We'll open up for question. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh,